Facebook. So if you're watching on Facebook, go ahead and say hi over there as well. And we will go ahead and get started. We've got Graham from Tucson, James from Kent. Welcome. Good to see folks from all over the country. This is great. All right. So let's go ahead and get started here. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Emily from GoWP, and welcome to today's panel discussion for Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Um, we thank you for, for joining us for this discussion. Um, I know that there's a lot of events happening today for, for Accessibility Awareness Day. Um, so we, we're really uh, grateful to have you here with us. So thank you for that. Um, Co-hosting this panel with me today is Bet Hannon of Bet Hannon Business Website. So Bet, would you like to, to get us started and say a few words here? Yeah, so we're really excited to be able to co-sponsor today. We, uh, we as an agency are really committed to accessibility and uh, just try to find ways to broaden the information that's out there so that people can um, learn about accessibility and uh, get themselves more committed to it. And you know, accessibility is the right thing to do in terms of just democratizing access to the entire internet, but it also does things like make your site easier for everybody to use and improves your SEO and uh, all of those great other benefits. And so um, we love talking to people about um, pointing them to resources. So we're just really excited to be able to co-sponsor today. Awesome. Thanks for, thank you, to Beth. Go WP for helping us do this. So. Well, and thank you to Beth for, she came to me with this idea and I thought it was a fantastic idea. So I was so happy that she she helped us put this on and, and organize this, this event really, really impressive panel we have here today. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. So thank you, Bet, and we're, we're happy yeah. to have you with us today. Thank you. Um, so really quick, I just wanna say a couple words about GoWP in case anyone watching here isn't familiar with us. Um, at GoWP, it's our mission to create, happy, create happiness uh, by <laughs> helping agency owners grow and increase profits. So whether you're ready to bring on a new team member or you're looking to outsource work so you can focus on growth, we've got you covered. I also want to mention that creating a GoWP partner account is 100% free and gets you access to all sorts of resources to grow your agency. Um, in our knowledge base there, we have maintenance schedule lead magnet along with a landing page template that you can throw together on your website and start generating leads for maintenance plans. Um, we have also uh, all kinds of page templates to use for case studies and, and, and pricing pages and things like that. So I encourage you to create your account. It's free, like I said, and you can check out what we have in the knowledge base um, and, and start seeing the ways that we're here to help you grow. So if you have any ideas also, we're, we're happy to hear them. Um, and we'll put a link to creating your account there in the chat also. Uh, if you have any questions about partnering with GoWP and how we can help your agency, please feel free to reach out um, either in the chat. You can find me in the Facebook group. You can email me at emily at gowp.com. Check out our website, any of those work. Um, speaking of the Facebook group, if you're here in the Zoom room, uh, you may not be a member of our Facebook group. So we have the GoWP Niche Agency Owners uh, group, and we are live streaming this panel discussion there right now. So we've got folks over there watching as well. Um, this is a community of agency professionals who either you know already serve a niche market or are looking to niche down, or really are just running an agency and looking for for a community to, to help you grow. So it's it's a great place. We spend a lot of time there. Um, I'd love it if you check it out and, and join us there as well. So uh, we already talked about the chat. Uh, if you wanna send messages that just the panelists can see, you can do that, but I encourage you to change it to panelists and attendees for those of you in the Zoom room. And those of you watching on Facebook, um, let us know your questions and we will get them to the panel. So let's discuss this powerhouse panel and introduce you all to, to these, um, really industry experts here. I'm, I'm really excited about um, who we have here. So first off, we have Nick Peterson. Um, originally from Gotland, Sweden, Nick lost vision in an accident when he was a teenager. Uh, Nick has worked in tech for over 20 years, including IBM, Royal Bank of Canada, Oregon Commission for the Blind. And for the last seven years with his wife, Lisa, who is deafblind, he has run an accessibility consulting service. And we'll share the link there so you can check that out as well. Um, next up, we've got Meg Miller. Meg has worked in the tech, um, in tech the majority of her adult life from startups to large tech companies. Between growing up with a severely disabled sister and having a disabled husband, web accessibility is a personal pursuit for Meg. She continues to work hard towards ensuring universal access becomes an industry standard. 
Uh, then we have Christine Lichen. Christine has over 18 years of traditional and digital marketing background. Um, SCS Digital Marketing caters to professional keynote speakers and affiliated industry partners nationwide. As a deaf woman entrepreneur, she speaks on web accessibility, advocacy, and business related topics. Uh, then we have Amber Hines. Amber is the CEO of Equalize Digital, a website accessibility consulting firm striving to create a world where all people have equal access to information and tools on the internet, regardless of ability. Uh, in 2020, Equalize Digital launched the Accessibility Checker plugin, which scans WordPress sites for accessibility problems. And finally, we have our friend Ryan Kinney. Uh, Ryan founded Kinney Firm and in 2010 and serves as corporate counsel to technology and e-commerce companies advising on issues from intellectual property and open source software contracts to privacy. Um, she is a nationally and internationally renowned speaker. So wow, right? I mean, I, I wasn't downplaying this panel at all. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for being here again. Um, I want to start this panel discussion off uh, with kind of a general general question. And, and this one goes to Nick and Christine. So we'll start with Nick first, but could you tell us about a time uh, when you wanted to do something that people take for granted and you hit a roadblock? So, you know, shed a little bit of light on, on the experience for, for ex or what makes accessibility important. Um, thank you for that, Emily. And let me thank both you and Beth for inviting me to this. It's a fantastic opportunity to be speak to both you and um, the fantastic audience we have spread around the highways of America, right? Um, so basically a time when I, I felt I really encountered accessibility issues. Um, we're all business owners here, right? One way or another. Can I say filing my taxes? Um, the IRS, for example, is one of these, you know, websites that you pride yourself on um, being able to you know, filing, completing tasks and so forth. And as a business owner, you want to be able to have that control. Um, specifically, this case was both, um, it was when I first started out in 2014 with my wife, we encountered accessibility problems on the IRS website, not only to locate the forms and to filling out the accessible, I mean, accessible PDF forms. Um, to me, if anything, that reinforced so basically, I was not able to complete that task independently, but instead had to um, get cited assistance to complete those tasks. And that kind of, you know, focused and drove my motivation for making sure that um, both business owners and private personal consumers should be able to file and complete their tasks, including taxes and so forth personally. So that's, that's one to me, a very telling, um, issue for such an agency such as you know the irs so that's my basic story to start up absolutely nick that's a that's a really good one and i think um that for me that's a huge because yes i mean i think anybody who's done their taxes which is likely all of us right at some point i mean maybe you pay someone but at some point you've probably looked at those forms um and i yeah i don't doubt that so thank yeah thank you for sharing that experience um Christine, could you share something also? You're, you're muted still, Christine. Thank you, I forget that. <laughs> First, I wanna thank everyone for being here and thank you for inviting me for being here. Um, yes, I can, especially now that I work with uh, professional keynote speakers and a lot of the keynote speakers will have put on online webinars or online courses. And a lot of uh, what I find that a lot of these online webinars or online courses do not caption or transcribe. So even if I were to participate in the online webinars or courses, I can't participate because you don't even see the speakers. So it's just a slideshow. And you know that the presentation, it's not a full you know, transcript of what they're saying, it's a bullet point. So I'm missing out on what's actually being said, even in a, in a webinar or a online course, unless a transcript or a captioning is being said. 
So it's one of the things I try to point out that if you're doing a webinar or an online course, please caption or offer a transcript of your webinar or your online course. And the second thing, when podcasting became so popular, that's another opportunity that I missed out. Audio files, so not, you can't caption those, but at least on your website, offer a transcript. Same thing goes for if we're doing a YouTube. Even though YouTube does offer captioning, we call them caption. They're not perfect. <laughs> and if you could at least go in and fix it, make sure it's perfect, or take them best in a captioning uh, program, then make sure that your podcast, YouTube videos are captioned properly. So those are the two big ones that are out there right now that a lot of people tend to forget. And even, you know, if you turn off the uh, captioning uh, sound, or hearing people tend to when they're traveling or whatever, they turn that off, they would appreciate having those accurate captioning <laughs> instead of misspelling or whatever. But those are the two big ones that I like to point out. Absolutely, those are those are great ones, Christine. And I think if you if you're somebody who's been to at least my experience at um, WordCamp US, for example, I'm thinking back to WordCamp US in St. Louis when there was the one in person, and they, I mean, I, I assume they invested heavily because I, I know that it can be expensive, but they they invest in in accessibility, right? The WordPress community does, um, and when you go to a, an event with speakers and things like that that has invested in accessibility, you notice it. And even if you're you're not someone who's benefiting from that directly, it's, it's eye-opening because you're like, oh, wow, this is what's really needed. It's needed at this level. And, and when you go to other conferences where they haven't invested in it, you, you start to notice that then. So I, I thank you for bringing that up and shedding light on that. And I think it'll help others to, to realize that as well when, you're, when you are looking at things. Because I know many of us now do scroll through the feeds and you know, everybody likes to have the captions because nobody's turning on the sound on their computer when, when they're at work or, or things like that. So even though captions can benefit us all, it's it's needed in order to make it accessible for everybody. So I like that. I also like the, the cractions comment. So that was great. <laughs> um, is there any, does anyone else have a comment on, on this question that they'd like to contribute here? If not, we'll move on, on to the next. Um, so let's, yeah, Amber. Um, yeah, <clears throat> and sorry about my voice today, guys. Uh, but one of the things too, so we have some great people that have different impairments, but one of the things to think about too is there might be people with mobility limitations that are sighted or hearing, but they have to use different types of keyboards. Um, <clears throat> so one that is really interesting that maybe people aren't as aware of is a Darcy USB keyboard. It's D-A-R-C-I. And that is a Morse code keyboard. And it's for people who don't have full use of their limbs. So they might be sighted, but they don't maybe have fingers. And so they will use Morse code to type out. And so I, I've heard instances where people talk about if they don't have um, clear uh, focus states as they're moving through the website. They might be a sighted person, but they're using an alternative technology to interact with that website. and they get lost and they don't know where they are on the website. So that's another example too. Absolutely. And that's something I think many folks have, have not heard of, I'm sure, and aren't, aren't aware of that or hadn't, haven't considered it, right? So thank you for sharing that, Amber. Um, so speaking on, on making things more accessible, I know, that, I, know, I know that a lot of people in our community put an importance on on making their websites accessible or trying to offer accessibility services when they are um, building out websites and, and speaking with prospects and, and, and clients and, and the like. So are there any tips on, on using some of those free online accessibility tools? Which ones are better? What to look for? Um, how, can, how can you advise on, on helping folks using free online accessibility tools? And it could be agency owners or just business owners who are interested in making their, their sites more accessible. Um, let's start with uh, Amber on this one. Sure. So um, 
the most popular one that I think most people are aware of is called Wave. Um, and that is a great free scanning tool that you can use just to scan like an individual page at a time. Um, they also have, there's a company called Pope Tech that you can purchase plans with that does like bulk scanning with Wave. Um, Wave is great. We also use a lot um, the Axe Chrome extension, which comes from a company called DQ, um, D-E-Q-U-E. And that is a great option for just like, again, like one-off individual scans. Um, so that that's, those are both, I think the probably the most popular. And the thing that you have to be aware of is a, a lot of scanning tools. And we, we have an, a free one on wordpress.org accessibility checker, which was mentioned. We all try wave DQ or Axe and Accessibility Checker, we all try to get as much as we can, but not everything can be found by a scanning tool. And sometimes different tools have different levels of support for different things. Like this was something that we're working in ours to improve support for CSS variables, which is a more recent version of doing CSS. And I noticed that the Axe tool, when I ran it on a page, it didn't have any support at all. So it said, on color contrast, there are 78 color contrast items you need to manually assess if they meet or not. Um, but Wave on that same page was able to get it and our tool was able to get all but four. It was like, hey, you should check these four. So I sometimes think it's good to use multiple tools when you're testing. Great, thank you for that, Amber. And we've, we've shared some links for that as well. Meg, do you wanna share your, your experience on the, on on your side of things, being a developer and, and building these these things out as well. Yeah, I, I definitely go with the use a lot of things approach. And when I'm recommending out to people, it always depends on who I'm talking to um, and what I can kind of see their, um, their level is at because Wave is fantastic, but to somebody who's very new to accessibility having, you know, especially because they mix in the errors with the, with the features can be very overwhelming. Um, love acts. Um, I, I like Lighthouse only it, for the most part. I find that it gives you the same information, but I think it, it, it responds well with especially business owners because it gives you the grade. And sometimes people just want to see that, you know, that percentage, uh, you know, it, 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 we grew up in school and we want to know what our letter grade is. So that, that tends to help some people. Uh, a new tool I actually discovered at um, at AxCon um, is Accessibility um, Insights uh, for Chrome. I don't know if they have it on Firefox. And they offer some of those, you know, um, color blindness replicators. But my, my favorite um, part of the extension is it has a, a tab index um, visualizer. So you can turn it on start tabbing through a website and it will mark where it hits in order. So it goes one, two, connect the dots. So you can really visually see what is what the what the what the journey down this the page is and make sure that it's proper for somebody uh, coming to the the site using a screen reader or uh, just making sure your site is properly structured. And that that's a new new tool and I and I've just really, really fallen in love with that. But as Amber said, um, you know, I think the number is approximately 30%. Uh, they'll, they'll never catch about any more than about 30% and false positives are a thing. You know, um, anybody familiar with the Chrome extension has seen that, you know, you have to manually check this because they can't tell a color on a photo or a gradient. Um, and then there are other things that are just completely false positives. Um, and uh, and so you know while while um, accessibility checkers are just a fantastic tool, especially for that you know going going going. Um, additionally, uh, the uh, the WebAIM contrast checker, I, I they have that and they're they're linked to Main Text Checker. Um, I I run all, anytime I put together a scheme for a client, um, a color scheme, I run all my colors through there to make sure that uh, what I'm providing is something that um, somebody else will enjoy because, or be able to enjoy uh, because, you know, it's like, why put, why put 
effort into creating something when not everybody can enjoy it, you know? So you put that little more, you know, that one further step and, um, you know, your work goes further. That's great. Thank you for all of those great, great tools as well. And we've shared links to, to all of them here. So if you're watching, um, if you're watching here in the, in the Zoom room also, these links are gonna be saved on the, they're also in the, the Facebook group. So if you don't get a chance to grab them all now, they're always available in the, the live stream recording in the, in the Facebook group as well. Um, thank you for those really insightful responses there. And kind of moving on from that question, I'd like to go to Nick here and say, you know, Meg mentioned screen readers. So what do developers and designers need to know about the strategies or habits or patterns of how screen readers access online content? And then after that, you know, how could devs and designers make better experiences for screen readers? Thank you for that question, Emily. Um, and, and Meg, I'm gonna certainly go and check out that new tool about the accessibility insights. That sounds like a fantastic tool because like, uh, um you guys both said it, that you know you can't you kind of got to use multiple tools right um so yeah strategies um keep on i'm coming from probably a, a different angle at this accessibility world than most of you guys i'm a trainer by heart i work with disabled uh, people of all um, flavors mobility hearing vision and so forth in various combinations so um understanding assistive technology um how does a blind user approach the page um they're more linear um and they, like how would a deaf blind user approach a page uh, what do they look the importance of clear labels right um the appropriate use of a long description tags and um and so forth and to take the time to test your content. Meg is so completely right that all the automated tools in the world will only hit about 30%. You need to check your content with actual live, may I say it, smelly, disabled, blind users, sighted, whatever. Hearing, you need disabled users to verify your content. Um, does, you know, learn a little bit of MVDA. Some of you people here, Meg being one of them, has taken the time to learn how to use MVDA. And um, I'm, you know, Meg, has that impacted how you change you and design your websites? Uh, you know, after after you really taught me how to use a screen reader, it has definitely just given me a whole new perspective. And, and that just taking that time to learn, to turn off the screen, uh, load MVDA, load JAWS, um, or maybe, try to use uh, Zoom Text Fusion with magnification. How, what does my website look like when I'm at like five times magnification? How does the web finder work? And, and then try to, does my design actually function correctly? So that's what I, I can't stress it enough. Understand the assistive technology. If you use Dragon, like Ember said, alternative input methods, right? What's a clear on clear state? The Darcy keyboard, I've seen it. and if labels and forms are not dealt with correctly, it becomes really, really confusing. So anyways, you got me on my soapbox. Um, Thank that's you. my answer, yes. That's a great answer. And I've shared links to some of those um, screen readers as well. Uh, Christine, do you have any, any thoughts on this as well? No, not really. I mean, everything that's being said is great. Well, I want to highlight though, what's really important is having a disabled person verify and test the website. That's really you know, critical. Um, I think some of that's part of a challenge sometimes, and I think that's a question that some people might be thinking of. Uh, if I don't have access or a connection with a, a disabled person, <laughs> how do I go about it? And that's a good question, I think. And this is the value that this group has. You should have to ask, go around and connect. And we are more than happy to say, yeah, I'd be happy to check it out for you. So, so but that's important part. You may Absolutely. Having someone verify for you. Thank you, Christine. Um, Nick, you, you raised your hand. Do you have something else on this? 
I do, just a minor question. So yeah, I mean, this is all, just think of this from the developer side, which you guys all are. Um, it's all about themes. It's all about themes and templates and, and CSS and CMS rules, right? Um, I mean, if you take the time to invest, and I'll, I think one of you guys here is from, uh, I think you specifically, uh, Emily, work a lot with WordPress. I mean, the accessible themes make such a huge difference. If the themes are tested correctly, if CMS rules are tested correctly, that makes a world of difference. And I mean, if people started using accessible themes correctly, we would be in such better shape. That's a great, great comment there. Um, and I want to, I want to touch on that a little bit more, but Amber, you've got, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to add on the point of if you're not sure how to find users, I mean, obviously there's a lot of companies like mine and Betts and Nick's that do that. But another thought that's, that's useful, and this is how we find our users. So, you know, obviously we love people to come to us, but sometimes that doesn't make sense. Um, is there are frequently like nonprofit organizations that might be local in your community that supports. So we hire our um, blind testers from Texas School for the Blind that's right here in Austin where we are. Um, and it's great because we can pay the students and the students provide valuable information to us, but they also get really great learning experiences as well. And then if we are, need cognitively impaired users to test, um, because sometimes we know that a website might have a large audience there, there is a community here locally where people with individuals with disabilities go live there and it helps them to get job experience and like live independently of their parents or family members. And so we go there and we'll say, can we hire them, you know, one off? So I would say like looking at nonprofits in your community is a good way as well. If you don't, for whatever reason, it doesn't make sense to work with an accessibility agency. Wonderful, some really good tips there. And I would point out that Bet also said in the, in the chat here, um, that don't expect people with disabilities to just give you free feedback either. You know, this needs to be compensated testing as well. Um, but really great examples there, Amber. Uh, Ryan. Yeah, I would just say, um, you know, from a legal perspective to reinforce what everyone's been saying from a technological perspective, um, you know, that scanners are, you know, only detect uh, up to 30% of any of the, the various issues. Um, lawyers know that too. So when they're looking for targets uh, to sue, they start with the, the scanning tools to uh, assess these you know, vulnerabilities or, or violations. And then they move to um, uh, disabled uh, users and people that obviously that needs to be the person bringing the suit having standing, um, but it's the actual functional issues. They don't typically cite in and lawsuits, WCAG standards were not upheld. There was a lack of alt text. They're not going through that. They're going through the actual experience of the person that's been, you know, blocked access from the site. So um, there's actual, actually a legal and financial reason, uh, you know, not just experiential. Absolutely. And we're going to touch on that more um, coming up also. So thank you for, for bringing that to the tape, that topic to the table as well, Ryan. Um, Christine. Yes, I just want to ask to throw something out, but when web designers and web developers are working on the website, do any of them create a user persona with a person with a disability? The reason why I ask that is because I feel that like deaf individuals are the least that of. We talk about screen readers more than anything. Now, I'm not saying anything, you know, think it, but it's that. We think of keep in mind about screen readers, and now we need to go out, not just the depth, but we also tend to forget about the keyboard. Websites are supposed to be navigated by tabs and other methods. So we don't think about it. And that's one of the things I probably talk about when I have a topic talking about web developers and web designers, creating user persona with a person that has a disability or some form of disability. So that way, when they're designing it, we're not an afterthought, we're part of the process. So we're not forgotten, or we don't forget us. So that's the point I wanted to mention. Absolutely, and I think that's a really good point because so often, you know, you have, you create a couple user personas when, when you're developing something, right? And it's true that very often, that there will be subsets of that 
user persona you've created that are people with disabilities too. So they, they're part of it, right? They're always included. So we, we need to start thinking more um, in that way. So that's a really, really good um, point there, Christine. And I, I hope people take it to heart and start thinking about that when they're, if they are using user personas and, and designing that way, which is a great, great um, way to go about things. Uh, May. I just want to touch on a suggestion for um, getting user testing um, a while ago, a couple of years ago, my husband and I discovered a website slash company called um, Chronically Capable, uh, basically dedicated to getting people who either are chronically ill or have a disability and basically getting them jobs in terms of like, we're chronically capable. So I always like to use that as a recommendation because they also encourage people to, you know, tell them that they're hiring and they would want to get somebody on their team. So if you're somebody looking for um, somebody on your team who can help you with user testing, it might be a good resource to look into uh, chronically capable. That's fantastic. I think we've, we've shared a lot of great tips on, on finding, um, finding folks to help with your user testing. So that right there is really valuable. So thank thank you all for all of those great um, great tips and advice on that. Um, let's go back to what Ryan touched on here. So <clears throat> um, a question that has come has came up multiple times in our community um, when we've talked about accessibility in the past is who's liable, right? Um, when when these lawsuits happen, is it the website develop the designer, the developer, the agency who's liable? Um, or is it the business owner for not prioritizing that and actually seeking out accessible solutions to their online online needs? Um, and then apart from that, you know, are there ways that the agencies or developers can protect themselves? Uh, Ryan, you wanna take a stab yeah, at this one? Um, that is a question that I get a lot uh, from my agency clients as well. And um, although the 11th circuit uh, recently held that, um, websites aren't a place of public uh, accommodation, the federal courts are split on the issue. Um, so the answer as far as, you know, whether the ADA applies to websites, the current trend is yes, the Department of Justice has issued the letter in 2018, yes. And the uh, Biden administration is likely to uh, continue, um, you know, that trend. But when you're looking at can the web developer or the the agency be held liable we you know the website owner sure uh and there's various factors you know i, I think a lot of the people that are tuning in today are, are somewhat familiar with why the ada uh, can be applicable to websites and and how and and all of that but the web developers now that's a great question um and the answer is maybe uh, and it depends. I mean, that's you guys are like, oh, she's a lawyer. We were waiting for her to say maybe yes. You guys are you're welcome, everyone. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, so uh, it may be based on industry standards, uh, contracts, um, and the uh, you know theories of of contributory negligence and and vendor liability. We're not gonna. Don't worry. I'm not gonna lecture you guys on on uh, the the law or anything like that. There's actually um, the chief accessibility. And legal officer uh, Chris Ribbenborough um, at Essential Accessibility wrote a great article for Medium discussing why web service providers should not be held liable. Um, but the the flaw that I see in the argument, um, and I, I shared the the link with GoWP, and they'll they'll share it here. They're relying on this industry industry standard that accessibility services are so expensive and, and outside the norm. So if a contract is silent on the issue that it should be implied that accessibility services are not included in a web development contract. Cool. It can also be argued, and I guarantee you it will be, that if it's, you know, that uh, accessibility standards uh, are industry standard should be contemplated and absent an, ex uh, an express provi provision that they're excluded from the contract that they, they ought to be. So there's, don't leave ambiguity. This is what all of my clients, if you have the ability to draft your own contract, do so. 
Um, and I have, uh, you know, actual knowledge and experience with uh, different agencies that have been hauled into court um, for these uh, theories of vendor liability or contributory negligence, because they had even at a, at a large, you know, they've been doing business for, for many years, have large clients, had provisions in their contract that say stated that their work product or deliverables would conform with all applicable uh, applicable laws. Um, that is a large, you know, gaping hole, and why uh, you know they were brought into that. So, um, best practice: quote accessibility in your MSA or your SOW as a separate service. If you're going to have minimum standards, if you're going to, you know, do WCAG uh, 2.1 or 2.0. Uh, double A, then, then state it, and then anything above and beyond your bare minimum. Uh, make sure that you're, um, you know, quoting that separately so they can, you, the website user has the responsibility for, uh, in writing, for electing to take that next step and or opt out of, like, we understand that you don't provide that service. And here's what I would really strongly recommend. For those of you on this call that don't specialize in uh, accessibility, create relationships with experts that do. So I see the parallel in accessibility um, with what I really uh, am more knowledgeable about, which is privacy, in that um, you don't uh, attain accessibility compliance, you maintain it. There are constantly evolving laws case laws, opinions, um, you know, best standards, best practices, technologies. As agency owners, we have certain skill sets that we are the best at and we want to be responsible for. And then we have other people that have different skill sets. I don't want to be reliable and responsible for knowing everything about every facet of web design and development. That's why I partner with other people and refer them out. So whether it's a Bureau of Internet Accessibility, that is, you know, a, a huge firm that really is more for the um, enterprise level websites or any of the people that are on this call today that are, you know, experts in their field, you know, make sure you establish that uh, in contracts, refer it out, let the people that specialize in this, you know, handle it and, and keep that, uh, you know, locked down. Um, additionally, uh, I have a client, um, Nebula Media Group, that offers a $50,000 accessibility specific insurance policy um, with what they do, do. And again, like I practice more often in uh, pri uh, the privacy area, and I'm very familiar and have lectured on cybersecurity insurance and data breach protection. But just knowing that there is accessibility specific insurance uh, available. Uh, the proliferation of court cases. I mean, there were over 11,000 uh, ADA cases on state and federal level in the US alone in 2019 and 2020. And they're actually seeing that go up in 2021 and uptick uh, in cases. So um, even if you know you do everything, you know the experts, you've you know done the quality testing, this is a preventive measure. Um, having insurance uh, to defend against these suits is extremely uh, expensive and time consuming. Having that insurance may be a fantastic way to go. And something else I learned from um, talking to the owner of Nebula that I wasn't sure about, but I think um, could uh, assist and impact everybody on the call is the fact that the IRS and the US actually offers a five, up to a $5,000 tax credit for small businesses that uh, have less than a million dollars in gross receipts of the preceding year or 30 uh, or fewer uh, full-time employees for accessibility specific, uh, you know, innovation and, and uh, web work. So this is something that you, you know, yes, there's cost involved and you have to balance that as, as a, a business owner, but we have every reason to be incentivized to do so if the IRS is going to give us a tax, tax credit of up to $5,000, right? Thank you, Ryan. That, so much great information there. Really, really good. There's been some good comments too since um, with what you were talking about. Uh, one was that 
the big takeaway there is it needs to be explicit, right? You need to you need to say you're doing you're doing accessibility or you're not. Um, there's let's see, Bet also commented in the in the chat here that she has she has no idea if it's enforceable, but uh, when a client refuses to let them implement accessible options, for instance, uh, using accessible color contrast, she gets them to to not only release them from liability but also pay all the expenses if they are sued um, for that. So that's that's something as well. Um, on that topic, and we've we've also shared the link there to the accessibility um, insurance, I believe, and so so we'll we'll share that in the chat as well. So thank you for all of that really good information, and that segues into a really good question here um, that Bet touched on in the in the chat that she does not separate accessibility services out as a separate package, right? Because she doesn't want to give clients the option to to kind of push uh, disabled people to the side and say, no, we need to save money. So we're not going to open our, our business to that to that population. Um, what's what are some thoughts on this? And and, you know, the other part of this question is kind of are there some accessibility best practices that we should always be doing? And are there some things that people, you know, folks could put into a package as an add on to their to their web design business. Um, Bet, I don't know if you want to join back in and, and discuss and talk about this. Um, uh, we'll go to Amber first, I think, and then Bet, if you want to if you want to tag in, feel free as well. Sure, yeah. Um, so we tend to think that I think a good place to start and on this is looking at if you look in the WordPress developer handbook, which I think used to be called the codex, but it's not anymore. Um, specifically what the guidelines are for accessible for a theme to be called accessibility ready. I if you're just starting out and you're just trying to figure this out, I would say that's a great starting point. Like you need to meet all of those items in everything you build. Um, I, I love the idea of um, ne always requiring every accessibility thing, but I think I guess that there are probably some people listening to this call where they're having a hard time getting clients to pay more than $2,000 for a website. And, and so like, I think there's also this uh, like reality too, right? Of when you're a, a, a freelancer, maybe just getting started and the clients that you're working with or a small business that them spending $2,000 on a website sounds like crazy. Um, <clears throat> so I would say like at the very bare minimum, you want your theme that you're choosing or the theme that you are building custom, depending upon how you start to have those items in them. Um, captions and transcripts were something that were mentioned that that doesn't necessarily increase the cost of the web development. It just requires more time on the business owner to generate those if they're not paying you to create their content. And so that's something where you can go back to them and be like, we, you know, you have to have this it's required, like just spend the time doing it and then, you know, give us a transcript so we can paste it in if that's how you work with your clients. But I feel like those, like those kind of things are a good place to start. The add-on that we always have as an option is user testing because reality is, is like user testing. I wish every project had user testing, but not every client has a budget to pay us to generate a brief, bring in, we do at least to users minimum, I'd like to do more, right? And then and then go through, do it, and then make all of the changes. Um, so I think another thing that has to be there is like color contrast. We flag that for everyone all the time. Um, and I don't know, we have a few clients where probably the contrast isn't right, but we're getting to the point where we'll refuse on like buttons or links. Um, if it's a really large heading font, sometimes, you know, but I, you know, I feel like color contrast is, it just has to meet at least double A. I try to encourage triple A on color contrast, um, but that's sort of where, what I think. I don't know if Bet wants to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I really do think that web accessibility is, is going to become what mobile responsive is today, right? In another three to five years, everybody will do these sorts of basic things to make sites accessible. And you can start doing those now. And I, I think things like color contrast and making sure that your font sizes are correct and all of those pieces. So a lot of that has to do with the theme and the design parts. And there's always gonna be stuff related to content 
as you're moving forward, if the client is taking over doing that content. So we, we really work hard to make those sorts of design pieces what we do in every site. Occasionally we'll get some pushback, but when I come back and I say, okay, uh, you know, recently we had um, this pink that's a part of your color scheme is not going to be accessible for these buttons. And, and so here's what you can do to darken it, to make it accessible. And the client came back and refused. Once in, you know, we'll not unusual to get a client refuse, but when I come back and say, okay, then you need to sign this release that releases us from all liability. And then you're, if you get sued over these things, then you'll pay all of our expenses because you know, if they get sued, then there's a lot of depositions that have to happen and expenses on our part, you're gonna pay all of our expenses. Usually, they go, oh, I guess I should take this seriously. Maybe we will make the color darker, but occasionally we'll get a client that signs off on it. Um, and, uh, you know, you've got the stuff that's related to design, but then there's the stuff related to content. So we try to do education with the clients about what they need to do to make their site keep their site accessible. So there's like somebody said, you know, it's not only the creating the accessible site, it's the maintaining of it. That's actually the bigger issue in a lot of cases. And so, um, you know, you can upsell some of those things, but I think um, you're right, Amber, it's the testing that's the big add on that we, we don't do generally with folks in terms of our, the budget levels we work with. It, it would be great if everybody had a budget to do that. Uh, they, they don't usually, but, um, I don't know that's helpful, but yeah. real quick, very, very helpful. Thing, yeah, just real quick. The the baseline, another baseline too, is we were talking about like thirty to forty percent of errors could be text checked with the scanner. Maybe that's the baseline. Like there shouldn't be any errors, and ideally, there's minimum of those warnings that are actual problems that can be tested with the tool, and then the above and beyond is actually ensuring everything else, right? Um, but that might be a good way to look at it if you're working with lower budget clients and like what should you have as a bare minimum in every project you do regardless. That's that's a great idea, Amber, and it gives you that tool of the audit to really to really drive it home as well. Um, Nick, you raised your hand on this. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think um, further to Amber's comment, and I apologize if I'm going to disagree with you here a little bit, Amber. I, um, I think, Beth, you are totally right in that you should not have a separate item for accessibility. As much as I agree with Ryan that it needs to be spelled out, um, this is a mind shift set we need to accomplish here. Web accessibility is not an option. If this was, if this goes building an inspection, um, you know, counties, cities, so forth, inspect buildings all the time. And if guidelines are not met, and um, things are not built to code, things just don't pass. That's really what we need to get to. I know that's maybe a little idealistic right now, but I don't think making the baseline at 30 to 40% is an adequate way of doing it. That's like saying that building is sort of to code and we will not accept it in the built environment. Why should we accept it on the online environment? The tools, the knowledge, the information is there. It doesn't need to be that expensive if this is done and included in, in from the start. Um, user testing can be made available and frankly the budget kind of needs to be built in for that um so that i take my hat off for you for not for being as committed to this as you as you are and um you know we can always find work of uh, working with lower budgets if needed and anyway, that's my two cents worth Thank you, Nick. Really, really good to have those insights um, as well. So we, we definitely appreciate that. So that, that's great to hear. Um, we are running up on an hour here. Uh, if you have questions, get them in. We'll try to get to them. But I want to make sure that we also answer a couple that, that our community members have already submitted in the Facebook group um, prior to today. Uh, one of them being... Oh, I'm sorry, Ryan, did you have something to comment yes, on this topic? I just, I just wanted that. to clarify. Yeah. Um, just wanted to clarify. Uh, I agree 100% with uh, what Bet said, uh, as far as accessibility, I absolutely believe is the future and is going to be the determinative factor for uh, ranking the same way that mobile uh, design has been. And, you know, the, the ethical and inclusion side, like, that is already, I'm, I'm here for this. <laughs> like, I'm here for this conversation. 
So a hundred percent, it ought to be incorporated in every single web design and every single website. And the reality is that not every agency or freelancer has the skill set yet to be able to implement it. So we do that through advocacy and education, but, and putting that part aside, understanding that there are far more people de building, developing and selling websites. And there are people that have this expertise available to provide these skill sets. The way to limit your legal liability is to spell out contractually what you are or are not doing and to partner with people that have the skill sets that you don't have. Part of what you can do to make the, the web a more accessible place is to inform your clients that they have this responsibility and or accessibility services are not something that you provide and introduce them to somebody that has the, the skill sets. Absolutely, thank you, Ryan. Thank you for that input. Um, on that note, one of the questions that came in from, a, um, from Shannon Doa, one of our community members, was how do we address accessibility in the short term while doing website remediation for a client? Um, Meg, do you wanna share some insights on this? You know, there's <laughs> there's a lot of this is one of those things that, that there's a lot of gray areas in the accessibility community. Like everybody agrees that something should happen, but not everybody agrees how that should happen. You know, you'll have some people say like this is the only use case scenario for an overlay. Uh, you have some people who uh, I'm partial to um, notices. I I'm one of those people who kind of would prefer to admit they're doing something wrong and let people know they're fixing it um, and hope that that graces me with leniency. Um, you know, so for, for my, my answer here is there, there is, um, there's no one answer, especially because your website could have such a variety of different issues that you are trying to remediate. You could have a couple small things like some design tweaks. You know, you you're you're working in very light pastels. You need a new color scheme, you know, or you could be better off starting from the ground up. So um, I, I you know, when I know my client, what I'll do with my clients uh, who are um, who are working in um, who are who are in a, the middle of a remediation, you know, I like to encourage them to put a note in the sidebar, possibly in the footer. Um, I've even snuck it in um, into the headers. Um, and it was and and and, you know, if, if it's little things, you know, just get them done. But um, I, I, I like to let people know we're working on it. That That is my biggest recommendation. Put somewhere on the website where it's going to be um, accessible and 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 somebody will, will end up hearing it or seeing it or just absorb the information however they need to be and um, let them know, look, we know we're not doing this right right now. We're working on it and we hope to be bringing you a better experience soon. That's the method I'm partial to. Again, somebody else may say slap accessibility on there and and call it a day and then we'll get the new theme launched. Um, it, it 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 there's so many factors that that play in and it comes down to what your company is 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 partial to and wants to accomplish. Absolutely, that's a great answer, Meg. And we got some comments while you were talking. Um, Beth mentioned how effective would an accessibility statement that says something along the lines of we've made our best effort if you find anything please let us know christine i saw that you responded in the in the chat do you want to do you want to respond to that question on the panel i'm kind of okay with that but it's from my experience that when i try to point out an issue eight times out of ten i don't get any response so if you're going to put such a statement on there, at least acknowledge them. If you're not, don't. Fair enough. I would say that that's a really, yeah, if you're going to slap that up there and not do anything about it, then don't even bother. Um, but if you are taking it seriously, then then yes. And and Ryan, do you want to, you you mentioned well, also. I just said, I mean, that that's a very specific uh, legal question, you know, as far as the legal effectiveness. I actually want to research that and get back. I will post my uh, response in the Facebook 
uh, go to WP channel when I have an answer for you all. But yeah, um, uh, like Christine said, I mean, it's the same with anything. I think, I think all of us as consumers are kind of done with the lip service and the public facing statements of diversity and inclusion or, you know, privacy or accessibility. Practice what you preach. If you're going to make a statement that you care about, fill in blank, stand behind it, respond, you know, and, and I really loved uh, Meg's suggestion. I mean, I think setting aside again, like the legal and, and the people that want to sue you just to sue you. I mean, as consumers, I think we can support people undergoing a journey or a process. If you're making an effort, we're going to appreciate that. And the notice really gives the, uh, your clients, your customers, the opportunity to see that you're working to improve the services you're providing them. Absolutely. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for that. And um, yeah, for, for those of you who are not in the Facebook group, um, go join. We'll put that link up again. So you can we check out all these links after the panel discussion as well and any follow up there also. Um, I think most everybody on this panel is in that group. So you can you can tag them. And if you're on this panel and not in that group, we'd love to have you there as well. Um, one other question that came in from a community member prior to this discussion was, what's the best form of spam protection that's accessible? You know, obviously that click on this image robot test is not appropriate, uh, nor is the type of text you see where you have to, you know, decide, which is hard for a, an enabled person to do, right? With Without any vision impairment or anything. Um, so I'm not sure who is best to answer this question, uh, but yeah, Nick. Um, actually, so just to clarify, we're talking about CAPTCHAs basically, right? Sort of CAPTCHA yeah. style of prevention. Um, Google has a, I believe they call it, it's a 3.0 version that basically tests for human behavior. Um, so eventually end up doing the, you know, check the checkbox, you're not a robot. That is the most effective one. And um, I was just working with a, a client on that and uh, it works extremely well and it doesn't encounter any accessibility issues. That's wonderful. So that checkbox of just check the box if you're not That's a robot, right. that, that works. Correct. That's correct. Wonderful. Meg. I have, a, I have a little preachiness about this because there are so many people who try and one up the CAPTCHA and this, and, and I encourage everybody to keep an eye on this because um, especially, uh, a very popular one that you see with some form plugins, like big form plugins. Honestly, I can't remember which one it was, but it's one of those top three. You know, we have uh, uh, Ninja Forms, Contact Forms, 7WP Forms, and Gravity Forms. It's it's not Gravity Forms, but it's one anyway. Um, but they love doing a math question that is an image with no alt text. And you see stuff like that. Um, you see, um, I, you know, this this kind of goes into forms, but you know, I just encourage everybody to really look at their the form plugin they're looking at because, especially, some people do uh, the honeypot wrong, which is not it's kind of it, you know, it's not necessarily the the captcha, but um, especially with a keyboard navigation, I've seen some people who have tried to uh, program their own forms and they make the the honeypot actually um, navigatable by the keyboard. I, uh, and and so it's it's one of those things that uh, I 100% agree with what Nick said. You know that that human behavior. Click the checkbox. Okay, we we've registered. You're not a um, a human or or you're not a bot. But or, you know, especially in combination with a with a honeypot, uh, a properly coded honeypot is just the best way to go. Awesome. Thank you for that, Meg. Uh, Amber. Yeah, I was mostly just going to mention the honeypot, like as much as possible or doing invisible RA CAPTCHA, like we try not to do anything that requires someone to check a box or pick images. Um, I feel like there are things you can do invisibly in the background um, that will help with that. And then the other point on the math problems is those can be problematic for people with cognitive disabilities. Um, uh, either if they have like a lower learning level, the addition can be problematic for some people or potentially depending upon the font, you know, someone with dyslexia, it might take them a couple minutes to actually realize what the numbers are um, to get it correct. So 
I know like Jetpack does that and it adds it to the WordPress login screen. And I just keep thinking like this probably makes it so hard for people to log into their WordPress site. I mean, I find it annoying sometimes when I get presented with that. So I will I share that I have failed the math question and also the visual, like find the stop signs on mountains. And uh, I, yeah, everything yeah. with the hill. And I'm like trying to look at it. Is that a hill? Is it not a hill? Like, yeah. How do you, and I, was like, yeah, and I go, I go deep coffee. with it sometimes. I'm like, is it a hill or is it a mountain? And I'm just like, why are we doing any of this? So it's so true. So true. So yeah, let's all do our part to avoid those. Right. And, and like Nick said, the, the easiest uh, solution here is just that that CAPTCHA 3.0. So, so thank you for, for that response, Nick, as well. Um, all right, we're hitting 1.30 here. I know some people have already had to drop off and that's fine. Um, we wanna respect your time. Uh, I haven't seen any questions come into the chat, so that's great. I think we've covered a lot of really good information on this panel discussion. Um, if you have a question or if you're watching this recording after the fact, um, in the in the Facebook group, post it as a comment in there, and and we'll we'll try to answer it. You know, um, we've got the majority of folks on this panel in that group, and you also have uh, all of the websites for everyone on this panel, so you can reach out to them on on their own personal sites as well. Um, I want to thank everybody for for joining, and I want I want to give an option also the opportunity if there's any um, parting words that anyone wants to share, any of these, um, of these panelists, if there's anything else you'd like to contribute that we didn't get to hit on today that you were hoping to, to discuss, I'd like to open the, the table or put that on the table and open the opportunity for that as well. Amber. I just mentioned, um, I'm super excited, but we just got approved with the WordPress community team to start an official WordPress accessibility meetup. It's the first time they're ever going to have a topic based meetup. So, um, I'll post about it when we get it started, but we're looking for speakers and all that kind of stuff. And it'll be on the WordPress official meetup page and everything. So if you're interested, that's, awesome. that's coming up and we're super excited. So it'll Fantastic. be online only as opposed to like the community ones where you have to go in person whenever COVID, is. it'll always be online. So wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Amber. I look forward to um, learning more about it when you've got the, the information up. Um, Meg. I have a real quick uh, soapbox thing I want to get out there, and that is, um, you know, when it comes to getting your accessibility audits, you know, there's probably some business owners in here. Buyer beware. Make sure that when you're getting an accessibility audit, the people know what they're doing. There's too many people out there right now who are taking advantage of the, they're, they're fear mongering accessibility lawsuits, essentially. They are uh, charging through the nose only to run an automated scan or they're going the free route, offering something for free so hope, with the hope that they'll come back to you for business when they still don't know about um, accessibility and they'll still do the same thing. You didn't pay for anything, but the value wasn't there either. When you are looking to have your site audited, look into the background, ask questions about what the experience of the, of the people are and make sure that you are paying for something that is actually gonna benefit you in the long run because you could put, run your site through a, a checker for free. You know, it, but you want, it, it's not, it, it, yes, people who know what they're doing will run it through an automatic checker. They know how to read it. And then they also know how to go through the website uh, with a screen reader. They know how to check the things that automatic checkers don't. And that's what you want when you buy an audit. So just buyer beware and make sure everybody is, um, you know, keeping an eye out for that so that you don't throw your money down the, the hole of people like, oh, I can make money off this new accessibility thing. And, and I just wanted to get that out there. That's a huge soapbox issue for me. Thank you, Meg. And that's, a, I was not aware of that. So thank, yeah, thank you for taking this opportunity and, and letting everyone know about that so that you, we can be careful when we're looking for those, um, those accessibility audits or, or being offered, you know, accessibility audits, make sure it's with the right intentions and coming from the right place. So thank you so much, Meg. Um, Ryan. I think that ties right into uh, thanking GoWP and uh, bet for uh, putting this together because again, I keep stressing this, but you know, there's more than enough business out there for all of us. We all have our different strengths and weaknesses. And one of the beautiful things about open source is being collaborative and knowing the right people, knowing the people that know and being able to refer uh, properly. So, um, and parting, uh, I am thrilled to hear about uh, Amber's uh, new meetup and 
just want to say thank you to Rian Rietfeld and Rachel Cherry for all of the work that they did on the WordPress accessibility team, uh, making sure that the accessibility audit took place, and also Word, WordPress and WordCamp for their uh, WordCamps for their commitment. I mean, this has been in the past three years, I don't know that I've attended any WordCamp that didn't have at least one or two talks on accessibility. And when you look at you know, uh, an open source project or platform that is occupying 40% of, you know, the internet, uh, making sure that there is education and discussions are happening about accessibility and how we better incorporate best practices um, is always great to see. So just thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ryan. It was so great to have you on this panel. So thank you for taking the time and joining us today. Um, it's, it was great to have your, your legal expertise to, to guide us as well. Um, anyone else have a, a soapbox or <laughs> um, any kind of comment, parting comment? Nick. Thank you everybody for coming out. It's a, like Ryan said, it's a journey we're all on. It's all about collaboration and networking. So thank you very much for Emily and Beth. And uh, yes, buyer beware. There's a lot of snake oils people out there on it. Can I just say, stay away from overlays. Overlays don't fix it. Um, you need real knowledge, you need real professionals that understand what it works and you need good collaboration partners to work with. That's all I can say. So thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for joining us. It was great to have your, your expertise and your experience and, and your lived experience on this, um, on this panel as well. Uh, Christine. No, I just want to say it's been a great uh, conversation discussion and everybody here has been fantastic and this group has been fantastic and I just want to reiterate about user persona and I think that's the big thing right there. Um, we brought up about um, legal, we brought up about you know, understanding, um, not using overlay, we brought up the free tools right there. I mean every point here that was very important here but I think what we really need to be mindful about is keeping us in mind. Keeping us, you know, I think the biggest struggle that I see is that we tend to be an afterthought. We need to be part of the process, not as an afterthought. But that's the only thing that I want to reiterate. But again, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you for joining us, Christine. And thank you for, for driving that point home on user personas too, because I think you're right, it all starts there, right? It starts at the, the origin when you're doing the planning and figuring out who you're building a site for. And if you don't include this from the beginning, it's just gonna be more difficult down the road. So thank you for that, Christine. And thank you, Meg, thank you, Nick, Amber, Bet, Ryan. Thank you everybody for joining this panel discussion today. You all provided so much incredible value and so much knowledge. Um, so I really wanna thank you for that. And thank you to everyone who um, is watching today and joining in here in the Zoom room and over in the Facebook group. So uh, this recording will be available. And if you've registered, you'll get that email that we'll send out so you can check out the recording. And again, all of these links and everything are shared in the Facebook group. They're there in perpetuity for now anyway, until Facebook disappears one day, I guess. Um, but they're all there. So you can find everything there. Any questions, you can put them into the, into the Facebook group as well and we'll, we'll get them answered. So thank you everybody and have a great afternoon and enjoy the rest of this uh, Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Bye. Bye. Thank you.